Today, we will be talking about internal aerodynamics and uh, cooling systems. Uh, let's look at the things that uh, are considered in internal aerodynamics and cooling systems. Uh, we will look at the underhood. We usually see the, the hood is smooth, beautiful thing, and everything looks fine. It's a lot of uh, um, absolutely on aerodynamic designs under the hood, and it's all covered up and, and protected. So we'll look at the flow that goes into that compartment from the grill, uh, from the radiator area. Uh, and uh, we'll, take the, we'll take a look at the, the, uh, the flow in the, in the cabin, that is passenger compartment. I will mention some of the flow through the pipes uh, that are all around the vehicle. Those are the things that will be considered in this session. Uh, in this last session, actually, of the topic on uh, aerodynamics of ground vehicles. Well, engine cooling flow and passenger compartments uh, or cabin airflow, that's uh, passenger compartment flow uh, or cabin airflow, the passenger compartment is also called the cabin. Those are, those are things we'll consider. Uh, well, what, is, what are the benefits of uh, internal aerodynamics or flow inside as opposed to outside. Up till now, we've been looking at the flow outside the vehicle, uh, the flow all, all on the vehicle. But this is internal aerodynamics. This is, this is a flow within the vehicle that does not contribute to all these drag uh, components that we have talked about because they're enclosed inside the vehicle. Well, because this flow, this internal flow, takes away from the external flow, it reduces the drag. And this is, this is desirable, which means the, the, the portion that is flowing inside, if it had been flowing outside, we would have more drag than, than we are currently talking about. But what is the disadvantage? It exists inside, not outside. It exists. But because it exists, it introduces some aerodynamic drag in the inside of the vehicle. And that would have to be added to the drag that would compute from the outside components of the vehicle. Uh, and it, it accounts for um, up to 14%, generally about 9 10%. At the very least, even in vehicles that have been very well designed to minimize the drag due to internal aerodynamics, they still have about 4% of the total drag. This is your, this is your typical engine compartment. Uh, you have uh, you have the heater there. Uh, you have the airflow that's coming from uh, the radiator. This is the radiator portion. You have the flow going in here. You have the airflow. You have the heater uh, outflow. The pipes with the uh, and and uh, the um, the pads, the the flow tubes. Uh, you have uh, again. You have your radiator inlet. Uh, you have the pump uh, discharge uh, coming from here, somewhere here, the water pump. Uh, you have the bypass holes. You have all kinds of hoses. You have the engine block itself, which is absolutely on aerodynamic. So you have all these things. Now imagine a flow going through here. There's no smooth path for it to flow. It's hitting this and slapping this and going this way and going different ways. It's turbulent flow, absolutely turbulent flow. That's what happens uh, as the air goes. But after it's left all this, there is this gap as to uh, there, there, is, there is this gap between here and here where the flow has to collect itself and uh, form some kind of uh, smooth path as it goes under the vehicle and, and uh, outside, either coming out from here or coming out from the back of the vehicle. So let's look at the underhood uh, uh, initiated by the flow. Um, in, in the inlet and outlet design, some things need to be kept in mind. We want to place the inlet where the static pressure is greater than the ambient pressure. And that's the location of the radiator. That's, uh, that's 
right here, right in this one. And that's where you have your stagnation pressure. And the pressure outside, uh, the, you want to place the outside where the static pressure is less than the ambient pressure. There are two types of outside. Sometimes the outside is there. Sometimes it's at the rear of the vehicle. So you have the vehicle all the way and it's at the rear of the vehicle. In this case, we're looking at the outlet at a longitudinal position that's uh, right below the driver's seat. Okay. Uh, as we do this design, it's important to ensure as, as we place this, that the pressure difference, to, to understand that the pressure dr difference drives the flow in the duct. Uh, uh, and it, uh, it drives the flow in the dock or in whichever path that the flow is going through. So the hood outlet speed uh, is higher than the underbody flow speed. It should be designed that way. First of all, the hood, uh, the outlet pressure that is coming from the, the underhood compartment, the outlet pressure uh, you want it to be lower than the ambient pressure so that there is higher speed. If the pressure here, P1, is greater than P2, the flow will go this way. So that's one thing. The other thing is the speed as it comes out here, you want it to be higher than the underbody speed so that the flow can continue going that way. If we have two scenarios here. We have uh, what we have just indicated where the uh, hood outlet speed is uh, uh, higher, uh, where the hood outlet speed is higher than the underbody uh, speed. This is speed on underbody. This is the combined flow. The hood outlet speed uh, comes this way at a higher value. So what it does is it combines with this flow and it just drags this, it pulls this flow along. And so the flow goes on smoothly to the back of the vehicle where it exits at ambient pressure. If the hood outlet uh, uh, speed was lower than the underbody speed, this is what will happen. You will have a recoil of, a recoil of flow in the underhood and uh, there will be a shear buildup and there will be turbulence buildup. So there will be recoil flow here uh, and both before and after the outlet, and that is not desirable at all. So it's important to keep these, uh, what may appear to be little details in mind in, uh, in designing the airflow uh, property uh, as, as the air is going from the face here, that's from the hood to wherever it exits uh, the vehicle. Um, we have pipes all over uh, in line in the floor of uh, the vehicle and in the underbody of the vehicle. So we, it's, it's therefore important to understand some of the uh, some of the properties of the flow as they go in pipes. Uh, we have pipes as air ducts. We have ducts for electrical wiring. We have brake line ducts. Uh, the probability of flow separation in a curved pipe increases with the bend of the pipe, gamma. This is uh, the pipe bend, gamma. That's the angle it makes with uh, this, uh, uh, this angle, uh, with, with this line. So this is our gamma. The, uh, the greater gamma is, the greater is the tendency for flow separation. All it means is the pipe is curving more and more. As the pipe curves more and more, there is a greater chance for flow separation. That is the implication of that, and uh, uh, and, and uh, the probability for flow separation decreases with the curvature radius. Well, here's the curvature radius. Uh, so the larger the curvature radius, the less will be the probability of flow, and that makes sense because as the curvature radius gets large and larger, the pipe is approaching a straight line, and so you take away, yeah, you you. You essentially eliminate the the loss, the uh, the friction loss that is due to uh, curvature or uh, any form of bend in the pipe. So those are things to take into account. So what we desire to do, the desirable thing to do, the ideal thing to do is have pipes with large curvature radius, as large as large as is possible within the constraints of the vehicle design, and uh, pipes that uh, uh, have uh, 
little bent. That is, you want gamma to uh, uh, to reduce. Okay, uh, from uh, to reduce from this, you want gamma to be to be less. That is not the way it is here, but to approach this direction so that the pipe approaches a straight line. Okay, so those are some of the features to keep in mind in pipe design for undivided. Let's look at the flow again under the radius and look at some of the things that happen. Most significant internal aerodynamic contributor is the flow through the radiator. There's a cooling drag penalty resulting from the cooling airflow. The vehicle nose lift and the side forces due to cost will also increase as the cooling drag increases. Uh, so the flow through the radiator is very significant. We want to maximize the airflow rate at the least possible drag. That is the goal. So our practical design will be to direct uh, the flow to exit mostly just below the front of the, uh, of, uh, uh, the uh, driver's seat in the underbody of the vehicle, as we showed earlier. So we want the flow to exit from uh, here, from this portion, below, below the driver's seat area. Okay. That is uh, what will give us the maximum uh, airflow with a little, little drag. Uh, we, we typically there's a seal here. There's a there's a seal in this area, and uh, to prevent the flow from uh, from going uh, from coming out, so that the flow is all directed here. And there's firewall here, so the flow is properly channeled. After it's gone through the turbulence in this area where the engine is. Uh, it's a properly channel to exit in this area or at the back, depending on where it's chosen, but typically the flow exits here. Okay. Um, the the radiator and shrouds are considered uh, in the, the aerodynamic uh, benefits may to be considered in selection. Um, usually, not a whole lot of that is done, but they need to be considered in the optimization of the vehicle. So the pan and the shroud arrangement is as important not only to the cooling effectiveness of the radiator, it's also important to the internal aerodynamic uh, drag contribution. So look for a combination that uh, is, uh, is uh, adequate. Shroud can be Venturi type, uh, ring type, or box type. This is, uh, the, the, these are the shrouds. Uh, this is the Venturi type. Uh, Venturi. This is the ring type shroud. And this is the box type shroud. And um, uh, the the fan design can be axial, centrifugal, or mixed flow. Uh, here's your axial fan, uh, and here's your centrifugal fan, and uh, here's a mixed flow, uh, combining the axial and the centrifugal with the hope to gain the benefit of both. Uh, sometimes the architecture, the space available, determines uh, which of these uh, designs or combinations are used. There's no precise way to be able to determine the uh, cooling system drive. An approximate method is used and what's done is uh, the radiator assembly is blocked up and the drive is obtained uh, uh, when, when that is done and, and that drag is now subtracted from the drag that was first had uh, when the radiator assembly was left in place. Uh, so the resulting drag uh, that the cooling that we assign to the cooling drag is due to the combination of the cooling system that the radiator and all of the internal cooling systems and the interaction between the cooling and the airflow. Uh, that, so it, 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 that's what we would call interference drag. When we're looking at the external features, we would look at the mirror and the, uh, the interference drag contribution uh, at the mirror. The same thing, we have the same uh, 
phenomena happening here except it's internal. So there's the interference drag due to the interaction between the cooling system, airflow, and the main flow. The higher the vehicle speed, the greater is going to be the significance of this interference drag. And uh, uh, mark rate approach will be to measure the contribution from the cooling system directly with a train gauge force. It, it's easier, it's also cheaper, especially with the development of more sensitive uh, uh, strain gauge or other electronic equipment. But it's important to understand that when the, the way it's done when um, the radiator assembly is blocked off and uh, the, the drag uh, contribution is measured. The difference between that and when the radiator assembly is left in, that difference is not all due to the radiator. It's due to the radiator and the interference between the radiator and the uh, environment within which it sits. The cooling drag, uh, the cooling system drag, we have a grill requirement linked to the shape of the front end of the vehicle uh, and to the underhood airflow volume. Uh, grills enhance the look of a car. You have different types of grills uh, that you know, uh, have aesthetic features. But great grills, uh, uh, they add to the drag of the internal airflow. Uh, as, as good as grills are, as beautiful as they can be, they are uh, uh, drag in chorus. So we need to evaluate uh, the effectiveness of the space here concurrently with the front end and the underhood air flow analysis. Some alterations may be needed so that we can have effective uh, uh, grill uh, uh, incorporated into the type of leading edge that we have. And, and it's okay, the aesthetics. The less the contribution to airflow, the less is the incurred drag, and therefore the better the aerodynamic performance of the vehicle. Um, the, the, there's a thermal effect, especially in hot weather. There's the airflow, you know, but as the temperature increases, uh, the, the flow expands, and when the flow expands by conduction, it heats the external. So, uh, a hot airflow in the pipes, internal flow, can have an effect on the external flow because it hits the material and, and the heat gets conducted from inside uh, the, the internal aerodynamic object to the outside. And with a hotter outside, there's a greater tendency for turbulence on the outside of the vehicle. So there, there can still be a contribution of, uh, of uh, the effect of the internal flow on external aerodynamics. It's not, it's not a lot, but it does exist, and, and that is something to keep in mind. Uh, cabin airflow is defined as the flow in the cabin when all windows and uh, doors and sunroof, when they're all closed. That's what is defined as the cabin airflow. Uh, internal comfort affects driver's performance and alertness, uh, and these both, the driver's performance and the driver's alertness, they are uh, uh, essential uh, when it comes to consideration of uh, highway safety. So it's important to keep in mind the internal comfort of the drivers and of the passengers uh, and in designing uh, the cabin airflow. Constant air exchange is necessary as the vehicle drives along to ensure the freshness of air intake by the occupants. They get less ir irritated with, uh, with fresher air coming in. The recommended rate of air intake in a passenger car is 1060 foot cube per hour or 30 meter cube per hour. And the smaller the volume of the cabin, the greater the required number of air exchanges per unit time. And so the greater will be the power demand uh, from the cabin air control unit, uh, whether it's for the heater or for the air conditioner. So we want to have a larger volume, as, as, as large a volume as can be accommodated in the, in the architecture, in the space made available for the, for the airflow in the cabin. Uh, that way, less, less energy is required to drive the air through. Um, 
it's important that the air in the cabin is clean, is free of uh, free of particles and uh, of forms of pollution. Uh, the clean air requires that the inlet be above the height of the combustion air. That way, the combustion air is not uh, uh, does not uh, transit or does not uh, uh, get into into the clean fresh air that's coming. This requirement, therefore, for kind of constrains the location uh, of uh, the, the, uh, the cabin air to be somewhere above the hood, free of the combustion air, because uh, that, that's, that's from below up to that point, uh, the, the air is subject to interference from the air that has come from the combustion of uh, uh, a front engine vehicle. Of course, we are addressing a front engine vehicle here, not a rear engine vehicle. There are a few rear engine vehicles these days, but this, this is addressing a typical uh, front, uh, uh, front engine vehicle. We need to know, though, that we keep in mind that, okay, the, the location has to be above the engine location, uh, but the location of the air coming in has to be above the engine area, so it's got to be slightly above the hood. Uh, well, how high can it be? Well, it can't interfere with this visibility, so it needs to be kept below the windshield. So its area is pretty well de defined by its function. Above the hood, uh, below the windshield, in that, in that uh, pretty, pretty prescribed uh, uh, vertical uh, location uh, in, uh, in, in, in the vehicle. So with such upper and lower constraints, the vertical location of the cabin, cabin air is generally the region above the hood and below the windshield, and this is true for all vehicles. Um, there are different positions where cabin air intake is put. Uh, it's generally in the front and uh, around the axial location of the engine firewall. Uh, the outlet is creviced in the dashboard assembly. Uh, in consideration for, for human health, uh, air supply through outlets that have been designed to graduate the air temperature uh, along vehicle vertical axis such that temperature experience at the seat is the highest and, and uh, is lowest at the face. Uh, this, this conforms with uh, how the human body responds uh, in terms of uh, consideration for human comfort. Airflow around the vehicle occupant can help to provide a cooling effect in hot environments. Uh, so this is what's referred to as a factory air in cars. Uh, there, there aren't many cars that have no air conditioner these days, but it was a common, uh, uh, common car design when air conditioners were optional. Uh, so such air, uh, air pack design uh, is called uh, factory air. That's air that takes into account uh, the just to provide a cooling effect in a hot environment. Uh, that's just, it's, it's essentially the same way that the fan works. Uh, flush the air or, or remove the air, have a forced flow, uh, forced convection to remove the air from the body and so have a cooler body feeling experience. Location of the air that's exiting the vehicle outlet is it's important, but it's not as important as that of the inlet. And, and here are the reasons. Uh, generally, there are many opportunities for the air outlet to be created. The, the, what is probably more challenging is the air inlet. Uh, here is an outlet opportunity. The passenger passengers constantly open the do door. When they do, that's air outlet. Air comes out. Some comes in, but you know, that generally provides outlet for the air that has come into the passenger compartment. They wind down the window, and there are natural leaks in the vehicle, uh, so uh, there's plenty of opportunity for outlet. Uh, the air outlet should be relatively low pressure so that the flow can pass through, you know, the air is driven through, and it should be aft of the passenger compartment. And such locations as DPS. Uh, in the rear window just before the low end of the windshield. That's of the rear windshield. Now, when we say of the windshield, 
uh, it's the rear windshield. And within the rear bumper area, uh, designers use any of these combinations, uh, and it's 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 a matter of design taste. Uh, there's there's no particular be best combination. The combination depends on the other existing features in the vehicle, and those are the things to be considered. Okay. So these are the things that uh, uh, are considered generally in uh, in uh, vehicle uh, air design. Um, Humidity is generally undesirable, but it can be tolerated. Uh, high humidity, when humidity starts to be uh, a bit high, uh, it, uh, it can cause passenger discomfort. Air conditioner becomes essential. However, with air conditioner, there's, there's fuel that is used ultimately because uh, the, the air conditioner, the, the power that runs the air conditioner, which is about two kilowatts, is, is uh, provided by ultimately by the, uh, the fuel that's used in driving the system. So uh, the about two kilowatts, again, is used in driving the AC compressor, and that's a higher fuel demand. So whenever it's possible, cabin air should be used uh, rather than the, the, uh, the air AC compressor, because that would be a power saving. Uh, that, would, that would be fuel saving, which is one of the things that we desire in, uh, in ground vehicle aerodynamics. Carbon S uh, distribution system, they include the inlet cowling, the inlet plenum, the, the AC registers, the defrost, the defrost dots, uh, there's, there's some space, only limited space available under the instrument panel, uh, and this is where cabin air distribution system is usually positioned. So uh, a lot of intricate and delicate work needs to be done in this, in this very little space to ensure that the air duct system is quiet, it's not noisy, and it provides the maximum specific volume of airflow at minimum drag. Again, remember, the goal is reduce drag, increase the airflow, reduce drag. Establish, uh, uh, there are now, with the power of the computer, there are established computational methods that are employed as sub-design tool to, to optimize the flow in the basic design for the vehicle, and that basic flow can then be improved, uh, perhaps as uh, the models are, uh, are built and can be uh, modified and optimized until uh, the best uh, the best uh, volume flow rate is designed at uh, minimal noise in the vehicle. So this brings us to the end of uh, the different topics that we have looked at in uh, in the theory and applications of ground vehicle aerodynamics. Uh, uh, we started off by looking at the concept of drag, and then we looked at uh, noise and vehicle soiling. Uh, we treated experimental aerodynamics for ground vehicles. We talked essentially about wind tunnel testing and, uh, and road testing. We looked at the benefits and the disadvantages of each. Uh, uh, maybe mention uh, briefly about computational aerodynamics. It's really difficult to speak at length about computational uh, aerodynamics in the sense that for each design, there's, a, there's um, uh, an algorithm uh, that needs to be developed, and it's not the same for any two designs. Uh, but there are some basic, uh, basic uh, uh, algorithms that can be manipulated uh, uh, that, uh, for, for each of the design types that is desirable. But nonetheless, we, we did uh, mention that and talked about it briefly. Then we looked at vehicle stability and performance, uh, the, the importance of the consideration of uh, stability in vehicles, 
and uh, the performance criteria. Uh, that's why we talk about uh, traction, force, and vehicle. Uh, we looked at vehicle sectional design. One of the things that we mentioned there is that uh, uh, so there's a school of thought that uh, uh, classifies uh, vehicles as typical kinds of two sections and another school of thought that classifies it into three sections. Uh, I'm of the school of thought that classifies it into three sections. And so in vehicle sectional design, we looked at the three sections. Um, then we went on and looked at uh, trucks, trailers, and buses. Uh, we looked at trailer, uh, trucks uh, and uh, the, the front design. Uh, we looked at uh, the, um, the, uh, the features in the truck, in trucks, small trucks, uh, medium trucks, uh, and and uh, and large trucks, and compared trucks with uh, with buses, and and looked at uh, the drag contribution and the different competition, uh, the different combinations that we can have and contributions to drag from the different designs. Uh, we address trains. Uh, we talk more probably about high-speed trains than the other forms of train, uh, uh, commuter train, uh, the intercity train, and, uh, and uh, 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 luggage uh, uh, train. Uh, the, there's a lot of work going on and opportunities for improvement and for addressing uh, uh, vibration. Uh, the, those are found especially in, uh, in the high-speed train, the Shinkansen train and the um, uh, Maglev trains. Um, severe service and off-road vehicles, uh, one of the things we saw in severe service vehicles is uh, they're still uh, is there are opportunities for aerodynamic improvement, and one of the one of the areas that perhaps not enough has been done, very little in fact has been done in the improvement of uh, aerodynamics for uh, severe, severe service vehicles and, and upper vehicles is in the underbody aerodynamics. So opportunities exist in the underbody aerodynamics for aerodynamic improvement of severe service and upper vehicles, and. Yeah, to some extent in the leading edge too, especially in the lower leading edge, the lower portion of the leading edge of such vehicles. We looked at race cars and uh, convertibles, uh, the, uh, the design features of race cars. You understand that many convertibles, uh, design, uh, convertible cars are essentially uh, drag embracers. And that is known at the time of design, but the comfort that a convertible open top provides, uh, I suppose it's uh, something that the rider is willing to, uh, uh, to weight over the aerodynamic drag contribution uh, of such vehicles. And we look at uh, uh, some of the measures that can be taken to still have, to some extent, the benefit uh, or the, the pleasure that is desirable uh, that 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 draws one to to the convertible, and 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 still gain some of the benefits of uh, aerodynamic drive reduction. We look at motorcycles, the different types of motorcycles, and in in study motorcycles, we see that most of what can be done by the drive reduction is essentially in the front, in the leading edge of it, and it looks like uh, um, the introduction of a wind, of windshield in motorcycles. It's, uh, it's a very important uh, uh, feature in the improvement of, in the aerodynamic improvement of the, of the motorcycle and in the reduction of the aerodynamic drive. Um, and um, finally, we looked at internal aerodynamics and cooling system. And that's when we looked at the flow through the radiator, which is the most uh, uh, a significant portion of uh, the internal uh, drag, and it's, it's really the dominant internal airflow, the, fl the underhood flow, the flow through the radiator coming out of the car, uh, um, whether it's coming from under the driver's seat, under the driver's uh, longitudinal location, or coming out from the, from the uh, rear end of the car. And we looked at the cooling system, the pipes, different pipes in the vehicle, and uh, the, the the design of the pipes uh, reducing, knowing that 
the the less the radius, the lower the the pipe radius, uh, the greater is the probability for separation in the vehicle. So we want as large radius as is tenable in the design, and uh, we want uh, uh, a lower. Uh, we we want to reduce the angle, which we call gamma, uh, the the angle of diversion from the straight line, the straight pipe position. Uh, so these these essentially form the cornerstone for uh, uh, for ground vehicle aerodynamics. Uh, there now are opportunities to look at concept aerodynamic uh, concept uh, ground vehicles and look at uh, the different features and the different designs that uh, uh, would have uh, aerodynamic benefit in concept ground vehicles. So as you go on from here and uh, uh, do your own conceptual design, uh, look at these features that have been indicated here and see how they can be incorporated into uh, concept uh, ground vehicle design for improved uh, aerodynamics. Well, we've come to the end of uh, the series. And uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And I hope we've been able to provide you with, uh, with valuable tools to go on and make uh, great aerodynamically tenable vehicles. Thank you.